Welcome to the Puck and Stoner Dad Show with your hosts, Ginger Claus and Dusty. We are now on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Music by Burning Bridges. Subscribe, like. Hello and welcome everybody to Puck and Stoner Dads episode 20. It's been a while. It's been the off season. We've been busy as fuck. But we're happy to be here tonight. We've got a special guest, the most badass guy you'll ever meet. A scout for the Moose Jaw Warriors in the WHL. Justin Rayner. Everybody, he's here tonight. <laughs> Thanks How for having me on, guys. I'm, I'm doing well. Good. How are you guys doing? I'm, happy I'm great, to be here. man. You said busy summer, you know, it's uh, getting back into the grind, getting excited for the season again. It's coming. Yep. A couple weeks for us, training camp starts. So getting I was actually going to ask are you guys starting to get into like kind of full gear, get into the arena a little bit more. Yeah, well, obviously this year was a little different as we won the championship in the WHL and went on to the Mem Cup, so it's a short summer this year for sure. Um, yeah. Usually our, our summer's over a little earlier, or, or our season, I mean, and um, got more time to prepare kind of and, and get into the swing of things. Um, so, yeah, this year the season kind of it went much longer, which is always enjoyable, and, and that's the ultimate goal. And yeah. Um, then, like, right after the Memorial Cup ended, we had about a week and then went right into rookie camp, so. It's huh. crazy how, it, just, like, everything, too. Like, you're looking at the NHL and look how fast, like, that moved on. Like, it was the final, it was the draft, it was free agency. And yeah, it was all within, like. For sure. Oh, it's a long years. summer, though, when you miss the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's way longer than when you go to the championship. Oh, 100%. So. Actually, bringing that up, I've got a weird question for you two. The, um, I might have just lost it, actually. Okay, no, I didn't. Okay, so, Stallers, Stolers, Stolers, and OEL, right? When did they become Leafs? Was it July whatever july 1st i believe they signed was it not yeah day day one i think yep okay yeah. so does anyone know what day they got to hang out with the cup do you think that it was after that oh i have no idea but i'm assuming it's later because the the top dogs get the cup first i think yeah so do you think we could technically say that this summer two leafs had the stanley cup absolutely not Oh. <laughs> I'd rather not to even say that either. If you if you want that kind of karma too, I mean, no. might be the only Leafs that touch it for a while. <laughs> might be. I'm afraid well, it could be. I I don't like putting that out into the universe. Like, I don't know. Well, but my there parents, is the... my grandparents did it to me. They said I'd never see it in my lifetime. So if it's in the universe, oh. it's too late. You no know, crazy stat that they mentioned actually. There's, did you know, there's only been four coaches in all of NHL history that have won oh, Stanley Cups on yeah. two different teams. Who's that? Two different teams. Yeah. Um, Nano Rocco shared that the other day. It was like, oh fuck, they were like guys in the '40s, and then it was uh, Scotty Bowman. That's it, eh? Well, I yep, guess yeah. there's only four of them. Yeah, Scotty Bowen's like the only one in like... That was the only name I recognized. And it hasn't even... I'm pretty sure it hasn't been done at all in the cap era. Nope. No, I'd imagine not. No, there's only been yeah. like, what, seven winners in the cap era or something? Yeah, basically. Eight winners, something like that. Because like LA won two, Chicago won three, Pittsburgh won three. Like, there's kind of been like... Boston won two, I think. So it's kind of there hasn't been that yeah. many cup winners since the salary cap came into fruition. No. no, definitely not. So let's get back into some some more questions we got. 
So let's like basically let's start back from the beginning. Uh, like, what was the first thing that kind of drawed you to hockey? Like, what made you become a hockey fan? What's your very first like hockey memory that you can remember? Well, I I learned to skate before I can even remember. So I I started skating when I was two years old, I think, just out on the on the dugout at the farm and on uh, on just ponds and local like outdoor rinks and stuff with family. But um, what got me into hockey? I mean, my dad played hockey. All of his cousins, all the men, anyway, they all played hockey. So, um, yeah, they're they're. Um, basically the influences like my uncle Tony, my uncle Raj, my, my uncle, um, uh, Clive and my couple other people on that side of the family, um, really got me into the game and, and they've, uh, they're still playing, uh, old timer hockey. Like they're in their sixties and seventies and still ripping. So, yeah. it's, it's awesome. That's, that is fun thing about hockey, right? Like people like when, especially when you get in the beer leagues or pickup leagues where you do, you get people of all ages in there. Yeah. Uh, my uncle Lindsay as well. I forgot to mention him, but yeah, that, that whole side of the family is really big into hockey and always, uh, if we had like in the summer, if we went to like my uncle's place, they'd always have like playoffs on, on TV and stuff like that. They grew up, um, big Chicago Blackhawks fans. So, from okay, way back yeah. in the day so, so yeah. yeah um yeah that's kind of how my passion for hockey started just family influence and uh and then a little bit later when i was about four um my uncle tony and moose jaw he billeted ryan smith when he played for the moose jaw warriors so basically what a billet is it's a family that takes in a player for the season yeah kind yeah. of uh like watches out for them and whatnot and helps yeah. them out and helps them adjust billet to sisters letter kenny <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my uncle was uh his billet and then um in ninety four I was born in ninety one. In ninety four he got drafted uh to the Edmonton Oilers sixth overall and that's uh where I became an Oilers fan for life, unfortunately. I wish he would have went to a better team, but <laughs> one that could win a ship in my lifetime would be nice. I I missed Hey, the last don't put Oilers that in the yeah, yeah, atmosphere. Too. <laughs> I was gonna say I think I I think I'm even I'm even young to remember like Gretzky was traded before I was even born. Yeah, they, they won one good. more cup after Gretzky was traded, but that was in yeah. the summer of ninety. I was born in ninety one summer, so yeah, I'm in eighty nine, but late 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 eighty nine. Yeah, so so that's how I became an Oilers fan for life, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my journey into hockey. So like. Typical Canadian kid kind of story, right? Like families, absolutely. Like, yeah. Right from skating in a dugout. Yeah, yep. and that perfect. So, and like, like a lot of people in my family as well. Like they, I've got quite a few relatives that were like speed skaters as well. So, like oh, skating kind of comes naturally in our family, and and we're all like pretty good skaters in my family. So, obviously, not me. I skated myself right into the boards, but. <laughs> but you know what I mean. We're, I was a good skater before that. Yeah. <laughs> so, into your story is uh, you are a quadriplegic, right? And so, like the injury. So, like you you mentioned that, like it's it. Uh, we saw an article. It said uh, like you were playing. How old were you when it happened? I was thirteen at the time. Just turned thirteen. Like, I I couldn't even imagine, like that. Uh, the article also said that uh, like you got very involved. Uh, Ty sent me one, uh, but like the Humbo Broncos. Uh, I wouldn't say like super involved. Um, he said that like you you still like reached out, right? Yeah, I, I kind of put out a feeler, and then. Uh later on in like some of those guys journey I, I met um i met one of the players he came well i met him at a pats game actually i was scouting that night and uh he was kind of introduced he was sitting in the same wheelchair section as me um he was introduced uh to the crowd and then um later on i i'd met him more extensively because he came to the same rehab center as me and here in regina called first steps wellness center um 
Okay. They like basically, they're a gym targeted specifically towards quadriplegics and other neurological conditions. And um, mm-hmm. like, it's just an awesome place to like kind of get your bearings and gain some function and whatnot after your injury. So that's kind of where I met him. And then, uh, yeah, he's he's gone on. He's become a, a goalie scout. Uh, I think he's working in the SJHL and um, he's made Team Canada for the Paralympics this year. So. Wow. For um, I think uh, I think rowing, Paralympic rowing, I think is doing. Wow! But like he's sick. he's a huge kid. He's like six seven. He's jacked. Like he's a pair. So his upper body's still quite jacked. And yeah, he's that's an awesome story for him for sure. He's only from the chest down, eh? I think so. Yeah, mid back. Yeah. Um. So uh, I read something. Today it said that uh, one of your issues coming back to hockey was struggling with not being able to be on the ice, which is yeah, quite so, understandable. Yeah, hundred percent. No, I uh, after my injury, my injury was in December second, two thousand four, um, Thursday night in in uh, Hodgeville, Saskatchewan, um, and yeah, after after I was injured it took me a long while to be able to watch hockey on, on TV even. And, uh, I didn't get back into the rink for a long time because, well, a little bit because it was traumatic, but that really wasn't the reason it was mostly, I was jealous watching people play the game. I love so much and me not being able to get out there and, and, uh, shoot the puck around with the boys. A hundred percent. Like that would be frustrating. It's frustrating enough. Like yeah. if you're just a player and like you go watch your cousin play or something, right? <laughs> you know, like oh, I yeah. just want to get out there. Imagine, like, yeah, I couldn't imagine. So, how did you? How would you say you went from not being able to step into a rink to becoming a scout? Can you like? Yeah. yeah. Well, so basically it's just, you know, you love what you love and it uh, slowly worked its way back into me and uh, probably took about five years after my injury. I went through a lot of like, why me pity days and all sorts of stuff. And then I went through anger and um, like, you know, the, the stages of grief and whatnot. So it took me a long time to be comfortable with who I was after my injury because my entire life leading up to that, I was an athlete. I was in good shape. Um, I raced motocross, I played volleyball, I played baseball, I played hockey. So I was always an athlete and active child. And, uh, yeah, in in the blink of an eye, it's basically like, yeah, you're paralyzed from the chin down. You're probably never going to breathe on your own again. You're probably never going to eat on your own again. You're never going to move a muscle again. Thankfully, none of those things came true, but, um, yeah, it's just in an instant you uh you're struggling with your identity when you've been an athlete your whole life. And I'm sure it's the same for guys when they retire and stuff too. You're no longer that athlete, right? So it's just something you've worked your entire life for and it's kind of that's not who you are anymore. You have to figure out what you are outside of the rink. Um yeah. so it took me a while and then uh yeah, the bug just bit me again, started watching Oiler games again and started <laughs> Started watching local games around Regina, um, getting back in the rink. Buddies were playing. I'd go to some games. Um, I had a couple buddies that I grew up playing with that played in the SJHL and stuff, So, um, which is like a junior A league in Saskatchewan, step below the WHL. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just started going back out, and then uh, I decided I, wanna, I wanted to chase the NHL dream again. And uh, the first – thing I could think of was uh, scouting. And um, when I lived in Wascana Rehab Center here in Regina, um, there was another guy there called Brad Horning, and he had a spinal cord injury in 1989 playing for the Regina Pats. And um, he became a scout after he was a quadriplegic as well. Um, And he worked for the Chicago Blackhawks and NHL Central Scouting. So he was kind of pivotal in being like, hey, you can still do this and chase the dream if you want to. Um, and I didn't become a scout for probably like 10 more years after that, but he kind of planted the bug and I kind of started just writing notes while I would watch games at home just for fun. And, uh, and a couple buddies of mine 
uh, we'd always have a draft party every year because I love the draft and seeing new prospects and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And we just do our mock drafts and see who could get the closest. And I was starting to get pretty good at uh, predicting where guys would go or, or like who the better prospects were. So I started to like be like, hey, maybe I should look into this a little more seriously. And uh, yeah, I got a. Thankfully, my my best friend he worked for the Warriors as well, and his mom works for the Warriors, and she got me an interview with Alan Miller, and uh, we just vibed, and and he hired me, and uh, I've been a scout in the WHL for nine years since then. That's that's awesome. awesome. Like, so, like, so I was actually going to ask how long you've been doing, and you literally just so he just said it. Yeah, you so, should have asked because this is a stoner <laughs> show, and we would have thought it was hilarious. Yeah, this is uh, going to be season nine, I believe. So, or season ten, maybe. This might have been season nine when we won the championship. I don't know. It's been a, it's been about a decade almost. So, his career is like a fifth grader. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Ten years old. So as a scout, like, what's your ideal player? Like, are you known for, like, more looking at, like, forwards, defensemen? I mean, ideal player would be finding a Connor McDavid every day of the week, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those uh, those don't grow on trees. Uh, the next one coming is probably Gavin McKenna, so he's, he's a good young player in the dub, plays for the Medicine Hat Tigers. They're, ta they're talking already. I'm yeah, he's, that he's, quite a bit. He's, he's really good. Um controls the play well dictates the pace of play um shields the puck well always looking to attack and he's really smart with the puck so he's oh he, he's uh really good at setting up plays and finding guys when they're not even ready so <laughs> um <but> yeah, <laughs> i guess nice. i guess um i i i feel like i'm best at scouting defensemen because that's what i played but uh okay i don't know i don't do too much goalies like i've done maybe like two or three goalies over my years generally that's left up to our goalie coach to scout those guys um yeah, until yeah, 2033 when he scouts cedric <laughs> yeah yeah we'll have to get some game tape going here yeah <laughs> oh yeah well, there'll yeah. be lots of that won't all be good but so when you're uh, when you're say you're like you're known for more looking like defenseman are you looking for like the role guys, defensive defensemen, uh, depending on like obviously what the organizational needs are. Well, like, specifically when you're looking at a player, you're kind of looking for, I would say the three specific things you're looking for are smarts, hockey IQ, you're looking for skill, and you're looking for skating ability. But mm -hmm. other than that, you aren't like looking for specific things. Well, at least I don't when I'm scouting. I just write what I see in a player. I'm not trying to dictate that they'll be this they'll be that i'm just yeah. writing they're good at these things they need to improve these things this is their potential that's all i'm writing i'm not looking for like i mean i shouldn't say i'm not out there hunting for a Connor mcdavid but like you know what i mean i'm just i'm writing what i see in a in a kid so. yeah so how many games would you say you go to in a year uh, go to in person, probably about yeah. 30, 35 games, probably. That, uh, that's still with TV. Quite... I'm probably watching close to 250 games a year. Jeez. So I'm getting like, yeah, you guys get, wow. you get feeds for like all the, the whole WHL then obviously, right? Uh, yeah, I've got WHL feeds, OHL, QMJHL, KHL, NHL, AHL, NCAA, so I'm watching a okay. lot of hockey. The kids I'm scouting, though, yeah, probably about 40, 40 games a year. Wow. Go Cats. <laughs> Moncton, eh? That's where that I am right now. Moncton Wildcats, is that what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Punkton. That's an older jersey, though, right? Uh, yeah, that's from when I was yeah, 10. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I figured. <laughs> yeah. That's real old. That was like Corey Crawford. Vintage Steve Bernier days. So, uh, yeah, back to okay. So, have you uh scouted anybody who has 
came on to the Moose Jaw Warriors. What like? Oh shoot, shoot! You're scouting from. We've talked about this before. You scout in the WHL, not younger coming up, right? Yeah, I don't do too much bantam stuff just because it's hard for me to get care to drive out to these tournaments and stuff in small town Saskatchewan. So okay. I kind of just do Regina and and like area, but mostly just Regina. So the only bantam tournament that's here in Regina, it's a huge bantam tournament, but it's called the Graham Tour Tournament every year. But um, that's about the only one that I would be able to make it out to. So. I'm mostly doing WHL scouting for trade purposes and things like that. Sweet. So uh, the organizations let me get my feet wet as a scout. So, yeah. Would you uh, have you uh, brought anybody on? Like, I'm not sure you obviously submit your notes and then a higher power makes the decision. So (laughs) has anybody that you've scouted who has came to the team through trade or acquisition somehow, have they gone on to the NHL? Um, that's a good question. There's probably been a couple. I mean, the most recent ones, probably Matthew Savoy. He's not in the NHL yet, but the Oilers just traded for him. Um, okay. He was ninth overall okay, pick cool. in the first round for Buffalo, I think ninth or seventh something like that but uh we traded for him at the deadline last year to make a make a memorial cup run so and he was uh he was quite an important piece of the team so so i've done reports on him but yeah like pretty much anyone will trade for i've done i've seen play at some point along the way yeah i guess you don't go just to look at specific people you're just watching the game to see who's yeah so basically your eye I go watch like whoever's in town to play their Regina Pats, and then I do a report on basically the entire team that's playing them. So, okay. okay, I don't do too much reporting on the Pats just because we're we're about thirty minutes down the highway from them, and we're big time rivals, so we don't really trade that often. And our our guys got eyes on them all the time just because of how close we are in distance. So. But, but I'm watching, I, like the teams from the U.S. and the B.C. division and stuff come through that we don't get eyes on very often. Would you say if the deal's there, it's still like doable though? Like if some hot shot comes into Regina and you know you've got the pieces, do you think you like you guys would make the move? Uh we've done we've done trades in the past with them before with the Pats, but uh, generally they're like minor trades. They're is, uh, oh, neither okay. team wants to overpay and get or give up a really good player. So it's usually like fourth liners for fourth liners type stuff. But uh, yeah. we've, we've done trades here and there. It's just rare. Yeah, I guess even across the board, it's kind of rare, eh? I mean, it's like it's like Montreal and Toronto doing a trade or Edmonton and Calgary. Like you just... yeah. You don't want to be the loser of that trade in the Battle of Alberta, you know what I mean? Or yeah. Battle of Ontario or Yeah. Yeah. So how has scouting changed the way you act you actually like watch the game of hockey now? Like you're sitting down, well, you're watching the Oilers. Like has it almost changed the way you even sit down and watch hockey? Yeah, so I do a lot of watching away from the puck now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas, like, when I was a hockey fan growing up, I'd just watch where the puck's going and who's yeah. got the puck and seeing what they're doing with it. But uh, I'd say 75% of my watching is, like, away from the puck now. Um, and probably, like, 25 is with the puck carrier. But, um, yeah, it's uh, – I definitely – as a scout, I notice certain things more often now too. Like, does this guy give up on a back check? Does this guy cut when he should? Like, is, is he, he falling like up in the play? In the lane? Yeah, is he sticks in the lane and just doing yeah. certain things that he should be doing and stuff. Um, 
uh, and his so, positioning and whatnot. Does he anticipate the play well? Whereas before I was a scout, I didn't care about any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So you saying like all that that you watch for like is what would what player in the NHL right now would you say is like one of the most underappreciated players in the league for that kind of stuff? Like, you know, getting the stick in the lane, the passing lanes, and like always back checking, and you know. Well, I don't know if they're underrated, but I love the way Barkov plays defense. Actually, I just saw an article yesterday about how he's one of the most underappreciated players in the game i can see that he's got a great two-way game like people people tend to like those type of guys like when they're not putting up monster points they just think they're not valuable and it's like Mm -hmm. there's so much on the back end like the defensive end that goes unnoticed because it doesn't end up in the box score after the game like Sure, yeah. you can be like, oh, this guy had two goals and an assist tonight. He must have had a good game when sometimes that's not even true. He might have just, you just been right on play. for a couple. Yeah, he might have had a crappy game otherwise. Um, but yeah. like when you're like locking down your man, winning puck battles in the corner, uh, cutting off passing lanes and back checking hard and stuff, none of that stuff ends up in the box score. So people tend to overlook it. Like, for instance, this year on the Oilers, like Connor Brown everybody was crapping all over the guy because he hadn't scored a goal until like the game 75 or something but it's like he's only making four million and the amount of penalty killing value that he, he has does, yeah. and defensive play like he's rarely on the ice for a goal against and yeah. he just plays unreal defense and he's a workhorse and it's like that is valuable too you need to pay money for that in the nhl like mm-hmm. you you can't win without guys that do that dirty work um man how much i miss him as a leaf fan yeah yeah oh, I, me too he, even our team in the whl like martin rye yeah. savvy uh from he's a, one of our euro kids from this year and uh big kid but big workhorse and just does so much stuff that creates a winning environment and wins hockey games that doesn't show up on the scoreboard and yeah. uh it's just it's such an under appreciated role on a hockey mm-hmm. team and people think well you can get those guys for 750k league minimum and it's like well sometimes you can but sometimes you got to pay for that type of work ethic and that type of smarts on the defensive end like zach hyman even if they're not burying yeah well zach hyman's a, a great example of a hard worker that uh yeah just uh yeah. paid off for sure and that that's like an old saying that i like too is uh Hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard, you know? Like, you can be the, Mm -hmm. you could have Connor McDavid level talent, but you could be in the East Coast Hockey League because you just don't have some of the other intangibles to make it to the NHL, you know what I mean? Exactly. Whereas Zach Hyman early in his career probably had East Coast Hockey League talent, but he outworked his own talent and made a name for himself. And now look at him. Exactly. Now he's, he's worked the skill up to a level where he's also a 50 goal scorer now. So. Yeah, sad to see like, him go too. It's like the 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 Kobe attitude, right? Like for like basketball, right? Like how Kobe was like always the first guy in the gym. Yep. Well, and yeah, that's the thing. Up. he had yeah. monstrous talent, but he was so good because of the combination of the hard work and the talent and the mental fortitude. It wasn't and just his what, talent, and oh, that's yeah. what separates a guy at that level from maybe a bench player in the NBA or something like that you know what i mean and that's why everybody in a professional setting like a professional sports league is talented the worst guy in the nba could go to your local ymca and drop 50 on everybody like they're all talented but there's intangibles that separate you from being the greatest versus just a role player sometimes but you need the role players you need the jj bereas you absolutely do and sometimes those guys are just not quite as talented, but work just as hard. And mm-hmm. and they're there because they have outworked their talent level. So yeah, I almost just quoted the quote you just quoted 15 seconds ago, too, about talent, <laughs> hard work. Fuck. I don't It's so it. true. And, though, I, like, and I look at, uh, so we're talking like the, like the worth that, but the talent, like I look at a guy like Phil Kessel, that comes to mind, like, so much talent but it was like man like 
or Alexi. Can you Kola. imagine if he had Zach Hyman's kind of work work ethic? Oh, guy would have been a six. Then you get someone like McDavid. You you probably would be putting Phil Kessel into that kind of category because he was a fast skater too. Yeah. Well, yeah, when he wanted to be. Yeah. Super talented hockey player for sure. But he's also funny, man. Have you re- like read some shit that Phil Kessel has said in the locker room when he was a Leaf fan, <laughs> telling telling Randy to fuck off and go eat a cheeseburger yeah. and shit. <laughs> <laughs> He is pretty funny. He's also got like a super awkward, like dry sense of humor. So it's like, yeah, <laughs> you either vibe with that or you don't. Like you probably either think he's hilarious or you think he's a freaking weirdo. But yeah, I, I think he's funny. Like I like people like that that are kind of eccentric and like awkward and shy and shit. I like people uh, like that. So. Yeah, he's fucking hilarious, man. I'd I'd pay to have a fucking sesh with him. I don't think he smokes. Well, he eats a lot of hot dogs, doesn't he? He smokes. <laughs> I I don't know how true that hot dog rumor was. I think that was uh, yeah, that was that was a. I think it's Toronto very media. wrong. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was true at all. You know, you don't play, play uh, whatever it was, fifteen or twenty years in the NHL with eating hot dogs as your mainstay diet. <laughs> well, I, I mean, don't know. Uh, I've been roofing with that. <laughs> There's Were some you guys that drink like Coca Cola on the bench. Golly, no, I can't imagine that. I think Obi drinks Coca Cola on the bench. Does he know it? Who? That's wild. If that's true, Ovi? Yeah, uh, I'm pretty I sure I've heard of too. like some players drinking Coca Cola on the bench. Six rock stars a day. Yeah. Oh, I feel like yeah. as a hockey player, you're drinking monsters or anything. Your heart's it can explode. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, I know for, like, pro motocross, they always got the guys, like, afterwards drinking, like, a Red Bull or whatever. It's yeah. like, that, that's water in there. Like, oh, 100%. Anybody who believes that's a freaking rock star or a monster or a Red Bull coming off a yeah. freaking 25-minute moto where your heart's been at, like, 180 the whole time, like, no. That, <laughs> would, that yeah. would kill somebody. <laughs> but it's all marketing, right? So. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people don't un, don't see behind the curtain of marketing. Yeah, yeah, just take true. it at face value. Like you never see them crack that Red Bull open. It's always just handed to them already open. Well, the thing is, they they've got like cans that will like sound like you're cracking one, but it's full of water as well, carbonated water and stuff. Yeah. So oh, they got they, fake they Red Bull. Certain- Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. They do certain things for their athletes because their athletes not going to drink that crap. Yeah, Maybe on an off day Mar- when they've like haven't done anything for like two weeks, they'll have one. But like, not right after a freaking event. <laughs> oh, yeah, you think Marner's drinking Red Bull? I have trouble getting from the work truck to the work site without a rock star, <laughs> a monster. We take three breaks. That's three trips. And you chug her, don't you? Yeah, do you I chug, chug them. Yeah. Empty one right here from earlier. Oh, drink you heard him, like Rockstar. Got to get a sponsorship over here for the work site. I think so. Yeah, that'd be bomb. Rockstar is my favorite. They got Rockstar the best. Can, Rockstar can sponsor the pod. <laughs> that'd be great. And they can come out with a THC drink. That would be cool. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool too. I agree. And uh, like an opposite of an energy drink, a Rockstar secret? Chill, like a sativa something or what? Yeah. Is that the <laughs> sleepy one? I don't know anything about weed. No, no, Indica, 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 oh, Indica, Indica. Indica. Couch. Yeah, Indica. Oh, okay, that's how you remember that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Indica Couch. Yeah, well, a drink like that would be good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Put uh, I make my own. Yeah, but knowing the way where oxers are, how they make people's heart almost explode, it probably make your heart almost stop. You drink too <laughs> many of your heart just like. Oh yeah, yeah. I go by with the two for a deal, and then can't can't understand why I can't wake up in the morning. <laughs> he fell asleep for three days. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, that could happen. I got to be careful. Remember the mar- wait? Maybe it didn't exist for you guys. I'm a maritimer. 
maybe it was just a fever dream. But do you guys remember Marley Mellow Moods? Oh, yeah. I've never heard of that. Yeah. It was it, like it a, was a relaxation yellow, green, drink. and red bottle. Yeah, or a can. Yeah. A bottle yeah. or a can. And it was different teas and stuff. Yeah. Apparently, they took that off the shelves because it actually had uh, CBD in it. Oh, yeah. Well, CBD is not psychoactive. Was that before it was legal? Yeah, that's why it was before it was legal, though. Oh, okay. So it's yeah. still part well, of marijuana, yeah. so they had to take it off the yeah. shelves. There might have been something else in it, too, that wasn't good for you. Or was good for you, but they just want you to think it's not. Oh, that's funny. So, Justin, tell us. What happens if you are a player in the Canadian Hockey League and they find out you smoke marijuana? Because I think they do it. I honestly don't know the rules around that, to be completely honest with you. Um, I'm sure it's not a good thing. I'm sure you'd get suspended. But uh, Really? I don't know. I am I mean... Probably. I mean, like I have in no the idea NFL, that. they do it, don't they? I'm pretty yeah. Sure I mean, there's, there's been recent studies over the last five or six years, though, that like it's actually like helpful for restoring your muscles and whatnot yeah, so like, yeah. i think i think over the next 20 25 years it's probably going to change especially with it becoming legal for recreational use and yeah. whatnot but i would uh i would imagine it's probably frowned upon for teenage hockey players to be getting caught doing that so yeah. well but there's it it is that it, it's they're under by it. they're under 21 aren't they you can play as 20 uh yeah, want, you can have three twenties on your team, and a nine yeah. and nineteens too. So yeah, nineteens as guys, well. Yeah. So, are they but you got as young as uh, young as fifteen seventeen though. Team, so. Yeah, because oh, there's seventeen on the team too, right? Yeah, the, I I just read about a fourteen year old who got drafted into the OHL. That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that's did he that get was the, status or something? Yeah. Yeah, there was an exceptional status. Uh, I thought that was in the WHL, though. Maybe uh, there it was, was the WHL. Um, yeah, Landon DuPont defense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the one that I saw. Him. Yeah, never mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I got a smoke the last. I think he's 15, so he'll be allowed to play as a 15-year-old. Sweet. Because of wow. exceptional status. But, uh, yeah. Cedric usually got to wait until you're 16. Six more years. So how like with this kid like is do you think he's gonna be uh, something like how big is this kid? I mean, you don't get exceptional status without being able to play hockey for, at a very uh, high level. Um, basically, he dominated his uh, like his age group. So as a defense, I, I, th- I yeah. think he was playing with older players at even. Like in Bantam and Midget and stuff. So, oh, wow. um, but yeah, he's uh, he's out of Calgary. So, uh, I think he so played you... for Edge, the Edge School uh, Prep School in okay. Calgary. Um, let me look quickly. Yeah, so he played. Let me see. I just want to ch- double check. Yeah, he's 15 right now, and he played U18 um, with the Calgary <laughs> Edge School, um, which is AAA midget. <laughs> oh, he had, wow. He had 62 points in 30 games with 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds. So, <laughs> what? Like 15, so that's, that's oh. how you get exceptional status. <laughs> <laughs> so he's obviously okay. like an offensive defenseman. Yeah. <laughs> Can skate real, real well. Uh, he's 5'11, 170. So, so room to so, grow still, too. But, so but that's around. a pretty, that's a good size for that age. Yeah, for 15. I mean, you got, you got kids getting drafted. That's the weird thing about junior hockey at, at the age they get drafted. Some kids are like, f- like five foot two, and yeah. some are like six five already. And it's like, 
you're kind of just like hoping if you draft a little short kid that he'll like grow up like his parents because that's part of it you meet with the families and stuff you see oh dad's six three yeah. mom's five eleven like you're gonna you're praying he shoots up from four foot two after yeah. 16 17 18 because I, I don't think you stop growing until you're what 21 22 as a guy uh, that's like yeah, your last growth spurt around there. So so you got room to grow on some of these kids. Some of them don't get past like five nine. Uh, and then you just uh if you're if you're gonna make the WHL at that size, you gotta have some shit bird in you. Um, yep. <laughs> so you gotta be you gotta be a pest, you gotta be annoying to play against, you gotta be speedy, you gotta be smart to not get yourself killed by some of these defensemen in the league. Yeah. And uh yeah, just uh we call that shit bird where you're just in people's faces and getting into it after the whistle and just being annoying to play against. Um, and that is such an underappreciated role too. Like, yeah, that's like the competitiveness level, right? You got to have yeah. more of it when you're that size because the, the kids that are six foot five, two thirty, they can get away with being not as competitive sometimes and mm-hmm. just using their body to force things. Exactly. Yeah. But that's also a hindrance for some kids. They get drafted at six five and they've been dominating these kids at the lower level. And then they get yeah. to the WHL and they can't play like they did. Because you're playing against so stronger used to, people, right? Yeah. yeah, you're playing against guys your size that know how to yeah. use their body. Now they're not yeah. just getting away with it from being big. Exactly. They're, they're forcing the play at that size. They're cutting, they're they can skate, they can hit. So uh, some kids, it's a hindrance for being too big, too quick. Yeah. But uh, every kid's different, right? So mm-hmm. it's just uh, you're, you're looking for that combination of the, the kid that's got enough grit and competitiveness and enough talent and IQ to, to make the WHL. Because there's a ton of talented kids that get drafted every year that never play a game in junior hockey. So. Triple A is the, the highest they go, or junior A or junior B college yeah. sometimes. So it's yeah. Yeah. maybe Europe if they're lucky. And then it, you get the uh, kids it takes that... a special combination to make it into these ranks of hockey, even junior hockey, and then up to the American League or East Coast, or ultimately the NHL is the, the best, what, 870, 900 players on earth, basically. Yeah. With I maybe know, a couple outliers it. over in Europe. Like, yeah, it's you're you're in the best thousand hockey players on planet Earth, like exactly. at that point. So it's like, yeah, it it takes a it takes a lot. luck, skill, determination, grit, IQ, like everything's got to go right for you to make the NHL. Yeah, <laughs> you don't make it by mistake. Well, maybe some players do. No, I don't think there's a single guy who's ever made the NHL by mistake. What about uh, uh, Daggle? No, because he was he was insane. Yeah, yeah, he that. was really good. He had like 150 points in junior one year or some shit. Yeah, he he just yeah, um, he his story crazy. is actually quite interesting too. Is his problem was he by the time he got to the NHL he didn't like hockey anymore. His dad was really? abusive or something, I'm pretty sure. And uh, he just had huh. no desire to play hockey. So I don't think it was like a a talent factor of why he was a bust. I think it was more just of an attitude. He was, yeah, he, was, he was done with hockey. He didn't want to play anymore. And it's like, huh. that happens no sometimes. I see kids at 14, 15 that their parents have killed the drive to play hockey too. So. Oh yeah, it, it happens. What you're? It's never a good thing when your parent wants a dream more than you do. No. Like I, I feel like you gotta let your kids be the motivating factor for chasing that type of dream. Yeah, like it, for it, sure. it, it can't come from you as the parent because no. that's just you that's gonna want it in your face. Like, yeah, you gotta want it, right? Like anything, like. Hundred percent. Yeah, even if you're going to law school or whatever, if you're going for your parents, like you're gonna struggle, dude. Like you are not gonna do well. You might or pass. You. you might become a good lawyer, but like not it's ultimately not what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're gonna be miserable while you're going through it. Yeah. And I feel like athletics really exposes like if you're not in optimal mental state, it can really expose you quick. I've, yeah. I've, I've kind of, I've seen, I, so I've, uh, 
So I, uh, my job, I'm a driver examiner and I'll, I'll get like athletes coming in to like the vehicles and you can tell like they're athletes and like people that are usually like they pay sports at very, very high levels and they get, just get so shook at the car. Like when they're, cause they're not used to it. Right. But yep. like. It is crazy again. Them watching them getting thrown off, and then it's like, man, just pretend like this is your, this is your sport. Just focus, like, and you'll be able to drive. Yeah. Well, going back to like a Zach Hyman, right? He's been cut from teams. He was never the best player on his teams growing up. He was always like that, that tweener kid that sometimes you can say he got opportunities because dad owned a million hockey teams, but. Um, <laughs> Ultimately, hard work is what kept him moving up and yeah. uh, not getting like down on himself. And I'm sure, I'm sure he's had those moments where he's like, "Man, hockey's not for me. I I should quit." But ultimately, show resilience and look at him now: fifty goal scorer in the NHL. Exactly. Great story yourself. for kids to try and emulate, even if it doesn't work out. Like whatever your dream is, if you want to be a pianist or you want to be a doctor or anything like you need that level of dedication and resilience and hard work, whatever you're exactly. going to do in life. So yeah, if you're going to chase a dream, you, you want to go out at full force and, and give it 110% because at the end of the day, we have one life. And if you want, if you look back in 40 years and say, what well, I really wanted to do that, but I didn't give it my all and you're going to have mm -hmm. regrets. So as long as you, uh, as long as you give 100, 110% in whatever you're doing in life, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't walk away with regrets, even if it doesn't exactly. work out. At least you can say, hey, I give it everything I had. I gave it everything I had, yeah, exactly. Man. And that's like, not it, to be successful. Any, but I also believe that certain things to be successful, you also have to fail at stuff. Like to the Hyman story 100%. we brought back, right? He got cut from a team. Like, who's to say? Maybe that motivated him more, right? Like, 100%, yeah. Something that would... Uh, crush a kid might motivate another one exactly and then like florida even given up on him right like florida was the one who drafted hyman yep Toronto. and toronto's like oh okay they they saw something in him obviously that's why they wanted to trade for him thank you ginger hmm? sorry i'm in the middle of getting a kid to go back upstairs what did i do <laughs> i said thank you ginger for toronto giving us hyman oh Oh, <laughs> now I'm sad I'm again. Spot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Brandon, it's all right. Yeah. You guys improved your D this year. You got a goalie finally healthy. It's your year. Uh, I wouldn't uh, say that far, but well, uh, you said it's our year. Oh no, now it's not. Oh, I mean, I'm not a Leafs fan, so I can't jinx y'all. It's just yeah. when you guys oh, okay, say it's your year. Even better. No, I think uh, I, Toronto's gonna be. If they stay healthy, they're going to be really good this year. I think they do have the potential. I think this is going to be the best defensive team we've. It's going to come down to if Wall stays healthy or not, because ultimately yeah. in the NHL you can't do anything if your goalie's on the injured reserve. Exactly, and, and like, and if he does go down, is Matt Murray really going to save the day for us? That's going to depend on your team D, but Wall's yeah. the type of kid that, when healthy, he can carry a carrier team he's kind of a, yeah he's got that shesterkin quality where like the team might not be optimal in front of him but you can go far because he can just steal games exactly that's what you, and that's what you need in the nhl is a goalie that is going to steal you a game once in a while is yep and I that's mean, you where can like, get away with a, a subpar goalie that's not really going to do that but you have to have like a way better team than like team d yeah. and be dedicated to colorado whereas like some teams they have a stud goalie and they can play a little more free and up and down yeah. the ice because they know like Vasilevsky's going to stick his freaking glove out and save a one tee from the, the left side of the net. Like, exactly. Like, and that was who I was thinking too. Uh, all those yeah, Russian like <laughs> Russian Colorado. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Russia is really dominating in uh, goalie right now in the S NHL. Sorokin, Shesterkin, Vasilevsky. Who else? Zabrowski. Yeah. Who was the guy Colorado had for a long time? Uh, Orlamov? 
Varlamov. Yeah, he's, Varlamov, he's kind of yeah. underrated, but he's still like a sick goalie. Wow, yeah, they, Varlamov. That's they got no shortage if back. they're ever let back into the Olympics for picking. Goals. And uh, who? It's uh, right now. It's America and Russia. Yeah, just dominating really goalies. Too. Hellebuck, uh, Ottinger, Ottinger. Yeah, they they got quite a few. Uh, I can't think else? of some of them. Is Bennington American? No, he's Hell, Canadian. Uh, no, he yeah, Canadian? it was Hellebuck. I like guy, but <laughs> I think there was like Hellebuck, Ottinger, and I forget who the third like goalie for like Olympics slash Four Nations Cup. And I was like, oh my god, like that's like three really good goalies. I'm gonna look up their top goalies right now. Ottinger. Alba. Oh, Demko. How are we forgetting Demko? Demko. That was it. As a freaking yeah. stud. And they got and John Swayman. Gibson, Jeremy, Jeremy Swayman. Yeah. Yeah. Jack Campbell, elite. <laughs> the best. <laughs> He's actually not that bad. His career stats before coming to Edmonton, he had like a 918. So. It's just, he was on. He was Edmonton, really. And he had like a 790 or something crazy. Yeah. So like Edmonton kind of killed his NHL career, but well, where did he, he go now? Did he go to Detroit? I think so. Yeah, so hopefully he gets back to the show, because that, that's one of the nicest dudes in the entire, like, hockey community. Yeah, he, he is. was. Him and, yeah. him and Zach Hyman have, like, golden retriever vibes yeah. as a human being. So, for real. I actually met Jack Campbell. Was he sick in person or what? Oh, man, he was on He's like a deadly guy. So me and my uh, so my fiance and my buddy Kyle they uh, took me down on my birthday to Real Sports, the bar there. So we we're getting some food. And I was like, "Oh, let's go check out the Real Sports uh, apparel." So me and my buddy are in there. Jack Campbell walks in with his uh, wife. Sick. My buddy was actually wearing his jersey. He comes up to my buddy and thanks him for choosing to buy his jersey. Dude, that doesn't surprise of me. Course. No, like, hey, dude, about that camera. he's a, like the nicest guy ever to go as band. This is like, this is the very first preseason game when they s- allowed fans in the building after COVID. Oh, man. See, that's so why I there, feel so yeah. bad about his career going the way it has because he's just yeah. a beauty of a person. But, like, why couldn't it happen to somebody that's like a freaking asshole outside the ring? Like, Jordan Eddington? Yeah, really, though. <laughs> Like, uh, I, cause I live by the saying that good things happen to good people, but like, I, I feel that's true, but maybe sometimes in certain mm. things, maybe not, but is it a tad bit of karma for taking the money though? When he had a great opportunity in Toronto, <laughs> I'm not going to speak on that. <laughs> I, it sucks for us though. We're still eating cap and now St. Louis is trying to steal our young guys. Yeah. And- yeah, it's a bad situation. Uh, yeah, how? Yeah, I was actually curious. I forgot all about that. How do you do? You feel about that? Well, my buddy uh, Jason Shook, he's an Oilers fan. He's from Moose Jaw, but uh, I know him through First Steps Wellness Center, the rehab center here in Regina. He was yeah. one of the trainers. That's how I met him. Uh, he's one of those buddies that comes through the draft party every year. Yeah, but uh, he's a lifelong Oilers fan too, and he texts me. He's like, uh, "What did he say? Frickin' St. Louis or something?" Um, I'm obviously toning it down a bit. <laughs> I was like, what did they do? So I fr- immediately like go hop on Twitter and I just see, yep, they offer sheeted both young guys. I'm like, oh my God. And like way more than they were asking for from the Oilers, right? Like it's been reported uh, Holloway was looking for like 1.8 and the other guy was looking for like around two or something. And they're at like four and a half and and 2.2 or something it's like yeah you you can't match you can't match broberg at that point you have to walk like you got to take the second round pick and just move yeah. on unfortunately so broberg's but, a defenseman right yeah young young yeah. young defenseman yeah he's kind of uh we kind of messed up his uh development he's asked for a trade before um uh so yeah that's, like that's why he's we, we kind of dicked though. him around in edmonton like we had him he should have been just playing 25 minutes a night in the AHL. And we had him sitting up in the press box as the seventh D man for like 
key development years. And it's like, yeah, you can't do that. I was just so stupid. Like you should have just signed a league minimum guy to do that and had him play in the A or something like just uh little development, things like that, that have probably pissed him off, which led to this situation. But uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. like that's just for a guy that's played what, like 18 NHL games or something like you can't, you can't, and he's a lefty, man. We've got a log jam on, in Edmonton at lefty. Like you, you just can't give him four point five for two years. Like if he was right handed, I would be like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like if he's well, right handed, he's, he's getting it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you pay a but, premium for those guys because they're rare. Yeah, but, or at, at least a guy that can play that side, which I think he can play that side. But like, problem is Edmonton wants to play him with Nurse, and they are not a good pair together. No, they Which, were terrible I mean, in the playoffs. Neither are CC and Nurse either, though. So, like, they're a black hole of freaking defensive collapses. So, <laughs> it's ultimately, I think most of Edmonton's cap trouble is that Nurse contract. Like, he should probably be around like six million, and he's at yeah, like, almost ten. If he was making I six, know. man, I think Oilers, Oilers fans wouldn't be on him at all. No, well, and him. and his skill level would warrant around six million dollars. Uh, the problem is, he's not a nine million dollar number one demon he's a two three guy maybe even a four and uh he needs to be insulated with a really good partner so Mm -hmm. he's not like a number one to me is a like a cronwall or a a bork or someone that can like drive the play themselves they don't need any help Mm -hmm. like they are the man back there you know what i mean like yeah, they command the team from the defensive. Sl- that's a number one D man to me. And granted, I realize there's not even thirty number one D men in the league. No, but there's probably guess, like I was 10, actually going to ask but... you that question. That's so funny. But like, was, yeah, I... you, you can't pay guys that aren't number ones like number ones. Like you got to no, pay you can't the talent level. Yeah, is. yeah. This is a great defenseman. He just makes way too much money for his talent. Yeah, that that's what I think the issue is, too. Yeah, so ultimately, I think they're going to probably match Holloway and walk from Broberg. That's what I would do, but... Yeah. I, I mean, right now, even without those two, though, I think they're 300000 over the cap, so they're huh. going to have to do some other movements, even if they match Holloway, so... Yeah, it's getting to that time of year now, right? Like, I'm kind of surprised you're not hearing a little bit more kind of like some stuff starting to move, but maybe you'll probably see that at uh, training camp, maybe. I think you're allowed to go into the preseason 10% over the cap. Uh, Yeah. You just have to have it down by game one, I think. Yeah, exactly. But ultimately, like, I feel like a team could, like, Teams could get together and screw you if you're over the cap in preseason. They just don't want to deal with you. Like, mm-hmm. if everyone else like kind of got together, but I mean that would be ultimate collusion. But I mean it could happen. So better or to get on that quick as possible, in my opinion. When people still have yeah. some cap space before they sign other guys due to injuries through the preseason or whatever. So that's when you can look at too. Like, is that where you can look at? Maybe sneaking a guy through waivers because people are like, no, we don't want to make you cap compliant. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why I'm glad I'm a scout. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff, yeah. all the paperwork and all the all the legal stuff and whatnot. That's a GM's duty. <laughs> Even in the yeah, NHL, yeah. if you're a scout, you're just you're writing your reports on players and meeting families and stuff. You're not you don't have to worry about crunching numbers or what's legal, what's not sneaking guys here and there like so like responsibility how like how do you get noticed by like an nhl team i'd love to know yeah <laughs> i would i mean I'm, I'm if any nhl teams are listening i'm i'm open to send my reports to you and see what you think and have a meeting <laughs> i've just got it like is it kind of the same kind of deal? You just kind of, you know, like shoot your shot, call them and. Yeah. Some of that. I feel like if probably like 80% of it is who, you know, unfortunately, but like everything, right? Yeah. It's yeah, exactly. Like it, it's just, that's how life works. Unfortunately, Yeah. pretty much any industry too. Like you, you got an uncle or a dad or someone that works somewhere. You can get a job pretty easy compared to 
someone off the street. So. That's how I that's how I got my job. Yeah, well, that's how I got into scouting, right? I told you about my best friend and his mom yeah. both worked for the org and I kept yeah. pestering them like, hey, get me an interview. I want to I want to scout. And she finally did after like three years of bugging her. And yeah. uh, that's how I got involved. So there you go, right? Look, I'm a out, Neville right? baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so would you say, do you have hopes of like going further than the W or is if, if this is what you do until you retire, are you cool? Just rocking out in the Western. Oh, I'm very happy with where I'm at, but ultimately, yeah, I'd love to be in the NHL as a scout, as a, an amateur scout. Um, amateur, not meaning like I don't know how to do my job, but amateur scouts just scout prospects. Versus yeah. a pro yeah. scout scouts other teams, right? So, but yeah. uh, yeah, that that would be ultimately what I'd I'd want to do. But um, I'm absolutely happy in the WHL. Like it's an amazing uh, league for developmental players, and and it's an amazing amazing organization where small community owned organization, one of the only community owned orgs. So it's a uh, it's like a big family in Moose Jaw kind of thing. So. It's a, that's it's an awesome, yeah, that's awesome want, team right? to be a part of. And, and obviously we're WHL champs. So that, uh, that's nice cherry on top. <laughs> and they are yes. pretty well known like franchise, like even in Ontario, like I, I could probably tell you maybe a handful of teams in the W if that. Oh, yeah, and I always knew. Moose Jaw is one, the one that I could, would probably be up to three. I'd be able to name. What is it that makes them like memorable for you? Is it Morgan Riley? <laughs> Morgan Riley, me a bit, but also uh, the Braden jersey Cole. was cool. I like the jersey. I remember playing uh, playing with on their team a lot uh, on the uh, Chief Be a Head Pro or and NHL, like be a pro in NHL playing on that, like the the headdress jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that jersey too. Um, the we reason I, <laughs> the reason I was, uh, kind of into Moose Jaw as a kid, I was a huge junior hockey nerd when I was a kid, but Moose That's Jaw awesome. stuck out for me because I read books by an author called Sigmund Brewer and, uh, he writes sports stories and one of his favorite teams to throw into one of his books was always Moose Jaw Warriors. Oh, really? Always. Oh, yeah. I have a book here somewhere about a, a native kid who becomes a Moose Jaw Warrior and deals with racism. It's not oh, okay. a true story. It's just like a made-up story. But, yeah, Sigmund Brewer. Interesting. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Now, would that be like back when uh, Theo Fleury was like a warrior? Uh no, no. Not this he it. was in the NHL when these books were coming out. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I just and, know like we got we have like in our dressing room we've got a an NHL alumni wall, which is really mm -hmm. really cool to go just go like I've sat in there before for like ten minutes just reading names on this wall. And we've got uh quite an extensive NHL alumni, so quite a few good ones. Ryan Smith, Theo Fleury, Braden Point. Morgan Riley, so got we got some. Uh, some oh, good, it real is good cool. Right? Like when you see like the history, because like where I live too, like it's pretty well known for hockey too. Like Steve Eiserman played here, uh, Ty Domi played here, uh, Eric yeah. Stahl, Jordan Stahl. Uh, I mean, it's the best if you're like into sports and history. Like you yeah. just nerd out. Like it's awesome. Oh yeah, like. Dick Todd was the coach, one of the most successful coaches. Roger Nielsen, like these guys are just like absolute like legends in the NHL, right? Yeah, Bob. Gaming. I'm sure most junior teams have like a good history too. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, the, the old Wildcats have a rich <laughs> one. <laughs> Who's the best player out of them? Come on. Uh, well, if you want to look at longevity, probably Marchand. Oh yeah. Because he's, yeah, he's been a good hockey player. He, he's, yeah, he's been good he's really for a good. long time he's too. Like it's not like he was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Corey Crawford. 
he oh yeah, oh, yeah. quite impressive I like, uh yeah. i feel like he retired too early kind of yeah I feel like he had like a magical five years and then just disappeared yeah like kind of like tim thomas tim thomas is yeah. a little different though because he didn't get a shot until till it was like 30 but yeah, yeah he was older just, yeah he yeah, was an old guy 32, when he won his cup something like that yeah, and just had like a six six year run or something like. Yeah, yeah, and then just fell off the face of the earth. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know why he didn't get an opportunity though. He played that Dominic Kasich style when everyone else is playing yeah. controlled oh, yeah, by play, and it's yeah. like managers are like, I don't know if I want to risk my reputation on somebody flopping around in the net like that. But at the end of the day, it's like Hasek has the all time save percentage for career, so. I think he's got a nine twenty or nine twenty two. It's like that's it was him that won the cup though, kids. right? Who? Tim Thomas was in net when they beat Vancouver, was he not? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So he was, yeah. Yep. But yeah, yeah man, so... it's Dominic Hashik, like that brings back so much. But like that me. style that style yeah. does not invoke confidence. Like it looks like it no. would get scored on a lot. Yeah. And it would if you're not Dominic Hasek or Tim Thomas. <laughs> yeah. You had to like everyone so else athletic. trying that style probably didn't make it past like the American Hockey League. You know what I mean? Like no. it's just, like it's not a very uh oh, reliable you're so style. prone to injuries. <laughs> and you're prone to injuries too. Especially leg injuries. Some of the ways Hasek and Tim Thomas would like, you know, fall on their legs while they were still oh, yeah. sprawled out. Like uh well, back and like hip injuries too. Yeah. Knees, hips, back, yeah. ankles. Groin. Goalies are fucked. Yeah. That's why they're stretching all the time. <laughs> yeah. And then when you were a goalie your whole life and then you stop being a goalie, you find you still have to stretch all the time. That's why you need those yeah. Red Bulls now, huh? Or rock stars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need stop one just stretching. to get up the stairs. I'm going to kickstart the, the body. <laughs> one so we'll ask you one last question we'll uh sure. we'll let you go we're keeping you late we'll all answer it too so you're way it's way probably too early, the earliest way too early stanley cup champion this year honestly in my heart i want to go with a team you guys root for but i'm not going to do that because i don't want to put that on you don't put that on me, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, shoot. Who who do I think is going to be real good this year? I mean, Florida's still going to be a wagon. Edmonton's yeah. going to be good. Toronto's going to be good. Uh, Rangers are going to be good simply because Shesterkin's a freaking god among men. Um, that he is. I don't know. I think Jersey. Jersey, that's an interesting pick. I can see Jersey too. Who it would be so oh, leafy. It would be so leafy for Sheldon <laughs> Keefe to win a cup with his first his first year in Jersey. Oh, it would be. A yeah. Hard, so. Oh, that would be. Yeah, that would be a kick in the nuts for sure. That would be. Yeah. I don't know. And yeah, we've had I, several. I think it's gonna be an Eastern team though. Like the East just has so many really good teams. Like, yeah. I mean, even the teams that are bad in the East should be good. Like, look at Ottawa on paper. I mean, ultimately, that's why we play the games. It's not played on paper, but like, I, their I don't know, be man. Much better than it is. So, I don't know if they can get by Detroit this year. Detroit, that's another one. Like, they've been improving since Eiserman came around. They've just missed the playoffs. Like, yeah, I don't know. We'll see I what still Duke think your bottom do, teams are going to be Montreal, Buffalo. I think it's going to be a mix of Montreal, Buffalo, Ottawa. Dude, Buffalo is such an interesting team too because, like, you look at all the guys that were like supposed to turn Buffalo around like eight years ago. They've all been moved, and they're all like contributing pieces to really good teams now. Yeah, like all of them, and Buffalo mm -hmm. still stinks. Like, I don't yeah. under, I, there's something wrong in Buffalo, dude. There's like a curse or something. Like, they need to go back to the red and black jerseys. Well, yeah. I don't think Hold they have on. the rights to that logo, though. I think the somebody owns head. that. Yeah, the Buffalo head. Yeah. I think somebody owns that, like, design, not the team. Oh, I think wow. that's why they don't use it. 
I wonder why really? they were able to use it for the reverse retros. Well, they probably got permission. Okay. I don't think they outright own the the copyright to that logo. Oh, if they so if bad. they do, they absolutely should go back to those because those were some of the best jerseys of all time. They were. But it's kind of like um, it's kind of like the one duck logo or using Mighty Ducks or whatever. Disney still owns they, that, so. Well, they're yeah. Bringing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're bringing back the OG '90s logo for the Ducks, though. Yeah. Different color scheme, but yeah. It oh, I'm good. colorblind. I can't tell. <laughs> no, it's that like that that one, the Buffalo jersey. Um, there's a couple others that are like just like Lady Liberty. Um, oh yes. Like there's just a couple jerseys that are like man, those are just timeless, beautiful, mm-hmm. like amazing jerseys. Like you should never, should never went away from them. They're sick. Yep. Yeah. What are a couple um, others? You guys got any? Oh. Logos? No, I actually I really like it's an older one. The North Star. Oh, that, that is, is a nice logo. Yeah. That Just one in the simple. Whalers. The Whalers old logo. Yeah. Too. Just that simple end, that green end with that star. It looks so clean. Well, that's the thing. Like, it's so simple, but it's so good. Yeah, like, and that's hard to do as the I know. I'm a graphic designer during my day job, and okay. trying to be simple and good at the same time is very yeah. difficult. So, I'm yeah, trying. Like, I'm trying to learn stuff like that just by doing like thumbnails and that. So, like, I give you so yeah. much credit for like the job, like the job you do, then, man. Because holy jeez, it's so hard. I mean, anyone can do it. You just gotta be willing to fail a bunch. As a, yeah. As that, oh, you gotta right? mess around with it. I've noticed that. And like, it's not you. You don't even have to put out your crappy designs, but you have to go through your crappy design period before you get good. <laughs> That's yeah, just part yeah. of it. Like, I don't. I've never met a graphic designer that was just great at it off the rip. Like, yeah, I'm sure that happens. Like, there's probably naturals like the Connor McDavid of graphic design, but I've never met them. Like, everyone I know has really crappy designs at the start of their career, yeah. <laughs> including me. I have a ton of them. That's what you gotta do. Put the hours in. Yep. Nothing. Nothing. We all start through. out as just babies shitting and pissing everywhere, and when we start <laughs> something we've never done before, guess what? We shit and piss everywhere, basically. So, got yep. start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We should. That's the maritime or look at it. I'm sorry, guys. Wow. <laughs> no, that's the truth, though. Yeah. All right. Well. Oh, yes. shoot. Oh, Frig, he asked about yeah. jerseys that they should have never strayed oh, okay. from. The old Dallas Stars jersey. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one was nice, yeah. What do you, what do you guys think either. of the... What do you guys think of the Fisherman? I um, loved New it. New York one. Okay, I, I love it too, one. but it's either... I feel like people are either really love it Most or people really, hate really it. hate it. Yeah, I yeah. think it's cool. It kind of looks like the guy on the sea box. I love the, the fisherman box. jersey. Yeah. yeah. I had I had a blank fisherman jersey growing up in Pee Wee. It was my practice jersey, so I'm like... Sick. Sick. Yeah, it just had like the color flowing on it, but didn't have a logo or number or anything. But yeah, just a little practice jersey that was in that color scheme. And the, the style shit. of that jersey without the logo is fucking awesome. I yeah. felt like I felt like an NHLer every time I'd go out for practice. I'm like this is sick. <laughs> <laughs> Probably looked like a no. doofus, but it was awesome. Yeah. I also love the Vancouver black and black the jersey. Skate. And what is it? R- the skate, red? yeah, the yeah. Skate, yeah, yeah. The skate, yeah. That's up there. But I don't like Vancouver fans for the most part. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't even I think I know a single Twitter. one. Well, the There's ones that I know in person are, are nice. I, like, I got some friends that are... are oh, yeah, do you have a problem Twitter. with Vancouver Twitter? They're fans on Twitter, yeah. They're oh, specifically oh. Twitter fans, yeah. They they are, that's like savage. most teams. Most teams they are so are savage in Vancouver, funny. though. Like, yeah. it's like them... Uh, I feel like uh, who's got a, who's another fan base that has like crazy like Boston Bruins has like crazy fan base. Ottawa, yeah, Leaf fans. Oh, Ottawa, no. Ottawa, yeah, Leafs, yeah, Leaf. Oilers. Obviously, Oilers got a ton of like just scumbags in their fandom. Yeah, like that <laughs> Oilers analytics guy. 
That guy's trash. Oh, I have had that guy blocked for like three years. <laughs> so he was so I, trash. I saw him being like racist to somebody on Twitter one time, not even like hockey related, and I just blocked him. That was like three years ago. And I've of seen course. every season I've seen some shit like where he's just like wilding out on Twitter and like being a doof. Dude, no, and, all like, the time, an asshole man. to people, and like, yeah, people are like, oh, is this your fan Oilers? Like, get this guy, and I'm always like, I always have to click like the show content because I have him blocked, and I'm like, yep, uh, that was a good block. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that guy's yeah. an idiot. Ah, uh, he's an idiot. Oh, there's someone leaves Twitter too. There's a lot of them. I don't, I don't care if like you have terrible Edna. Kicks, but don't be a, don't be a prick to other people like yeah, don't exactly. be wishing injuries on other teams don't be being racist don't be being homophobic like that stuff i don't like that stuff i just block yeah. you if you're like that i don't care if you're part of my fan base or someone else's fan base i just I have no tolerance for that no now, if you have do. bad hockey takes i'll sit and argue hockey with you all day but like don't get personal like you know no I know that 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 is what kind of drives me nuts. It seems like there's no like debate on that. Everyone takes everything so personal, and then they start going, "You disagree with me? I'm gonna Ugh. say something about you." That's the world we live in, though. Everybody's tribal, so tribal about like their position and their point of view, and they have to be right constantly. And I'm like, yeah. I have no problem. Like most of my job as a scout is like educated guessing, and. 40 mm -hmm. 50 60 percent of the time you gotta be like hey i was wrong about that kid like he either is way better than i thought or did not even come close to the potential i thought like you constantly admit yeah. you're wrong and i just that's how you grow things too like yeah politics well, and other sports and whatever like if you don't if you're always right like you're and always the smartest person in the room you're definitely a dumbass I feel like, yep. <laughs> yeah, like you're never gonna learn anything from anyone else if you're like always the the smartest person there, right? So I always, yeah. I always like to say like every person on earth knows something you don't know, so be open to, yeah, to whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like a lot of people like they're so tribal about their sports team and all that, like you say anything to them and instantly it gets like to a personal attack because they're like. They're like defending their body or something, or their soul. I know, right? Yeah. Holy crap, Man, dude! We're just talking about if, like, logo. we're just debating if Austin Matthews is as good as McDavid, and I don't, I don't think so. I think he's a couple rings down, but you clearly oh. do. It's like, holy crap! Just come oh, off man. the family and my disability, and like, holy they're not even the same conversation. Well, and like, I, you know what I, I mean? Don't not get why there's yeah. Leafs fans who, yeah, I don't, I don't get how there's Leafs fans that yeah. think. They're in the same yeah, category. I don't, I don't. Well, I, I get fandom and stuff. Like, if the roles were reversed, I'd be like, "Yeah, Austin Matthews is sick, dude. Like, best goal scorer in Oilers history. Yeah. Like, what do you mean?" <laughs> but like, I'm not gonna personally attack anyone or like be racist or homophobic to them just because they have a sports opinion I disagree with. Yeah, like, it's talking sports should be fun. It should be a fun pastime for all of us. It's it's and so it is for most great. of us, but some people get just unhinged, like just like like I remember the days be around those people that get so sensitive about certain things. Remember the days where there was fifteen people in the middle of the street playing hockey, and one had an Oilers jersey, one had a Blackhawks jersey, one had a oh, Wings yeah. jersey, one had a Senators jersey. They were all fucking friends, and no one even talked about what team oh, was better. Great. We just played hockey. Oh yeah, those were the days, man. Pretending you were your, the star player for whatever team you loved. Like yeah. I was always yeah. like Ryan Smith or something. Like, but yeah, I had but buddies that would be like Steve Eiserman or like whatever, just playing road hockey, just the best. Yeah, I was always Cujo. Oh yeah, that's it. that's a good yep. choice, dude. That's one of my favorite goalies all time. Yeah, Cujo Curtis was Cujo. dope. He was he was sick at every team he went to too. Yeah, another, another underrated team. goalie too was Ed Belfour. Yep, and he was my second pick. And then, then uh, another another sick underrated guy for Toronto, Felix Pot, man. Yeah, he was my third. People favorite. don't talk about him, but like he's so sick. That's my best friend's uh, favorite goalie of all time. Oh, Mine's Dominic Classic. He became like, Pot up there. I love Pot fan just because I used to love. Uh, 
Hex I think was dope. And then I saw yeah. Pothan beat Hextall up, and I was like, oh. <laughs> like Pothan now. Those are the days, man. When's the last good goalie fight we watched? Like probably like Wa and Osgood. Yeah, good. I mean, one, I feel yeah. like Talbot got into one with somebody and stuff. But Mike like, Smith actually ha- was in a fight too. Actually, Smith can chuck him. Yeah, he's kind of oh, yeah. kind of scary. But it wasn't much of a fight. He just kind of destroyed. I think I saw Fleur, I, I saw Flower Mark tried Andre to Fleury fight. fight when he I was tried to kid. fight. They stopped it. Oh, I remember that no, he whipped I up saw him fight like, in June. Let us go. Let us go. Oh, yeah. I saw oh, him this fight is in NHL. June. He broke his hand. Oh, that's not good, yeah. Just like McDavid now. <laughs> Connor's one and only fight in junior, yeah. yeah. Smoked it on the boards. <laughs> <laughs> in the gla- yeah, it's the board or the glass or something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he hit the stanchion, I think. Right, yeah. Like, missed his punch and punched the fucking wall. It's pretty much out for almost the whole year. And then returned <laughs> in the playoffs. Yeah, that's wild. Not the guy you want Convenient. to be fighting. No. Hey, well, I appreciate you guys having me on. That was fun. I really do. I, we really want to. We do want to thank you for uh, giving us your time. It was uh, a lot of fun. We really enjoyed this. Yeah, uh, this was great. We definitely want to have you on for uh, maybe a watch along or post game when uh, they play the Oilers if you're ever down. Yeah, sure. You guys mind me breaking down some plays and stuff or what? Oh, ab- absolutely. Oh, we'll do watch along. We love sick. it. Yeah, All right, we could do that. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I right. can't wait until me and Dusty are both super baked and we see a play and then you're like, yeah, that play was cool. But did you see what was happening right there? And then we're both just like. <laughs> or I'll be like, that actually happened about 10 minutes ago, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the game's over. What? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, anytime you guys want to talk. When the shop, fuck whatever. did we get out Absolutely. We really appreciate you coming on. Love talking hockey, uh, boys. So. We love having people on to talk hockey. So we'll definitely do watch alongs or uh, that definitely a watch along with Edmonton. When we have thir- we like having a third person for watch along. So maybe a maybe a Leafs Oilers matchup. Yeah, definitely. That'd be a it's lot funny. of fun. I-, I like watching the Leafs too. They're like obviously they're a high skilled team. They got like four or five really talented forwards. So absolutely, and obviously Orgs, former Warrior. Guy can skate like the wind and ultra skilled D men. So, absolutely, we'd definitely love to uh, set that up. We'll Man, definitely be in touch. Uh, everyone, thanks for coming by and uh, checking this episode out. Uh, make sure you check check out Justin on Twitter. He uh, will have his uh, link in the description, and uh, we'll see you all at the next one. Ice. Thank you for watching. Like. Subscribe. Check out our social medias. We are now on Spotify and Apple Podcast.